Good evening, and welcome to the New York Society Library. I'm Sarah Molliday, Library Events Coordinator. As we begin, let me request that you silence cell phones or anything that might disrupt the lecture. We really appreciate it. 251 years ago, the world was transfixed by the passing of the planet Venus between the Earth and the Sun, an occurrence that takes place only every century or two. Scientists scrambled for the opportunity to derive calculations from their observations with rudimentary telescopes of that newfangled discipline, the calculus. Meanwhile, non-scientists indulged in, indulge in predictions of apocalypse. In today's more enlightened age, we can view the transit with advanced technology, like a paper plate with a hole in it. And superstition isn't in short supply either. I've been told either our karma will reset or we'll have a revolution in communications due to the transit being a Gemini or something. Regardless, it's a big deal. So far, my favorite thing about the transit is the word for the alignment of three celestial bodies. Here, the sun, Venus, and the Earth. That word is syzygy. Is that not fabulous? Syzygy, I could say that all day. The only thing better than syzygy is Andrea Wolf's new book, Chasing Venus, The Race to Measure the Heavens. Whether the stars caused it or not, a kind of communications revolution did occur in 1761. Suddenly, scientists and travelers from all over the world managed to set aside their rivalries, overcome major hardships, and work together to figure out the size of the solar system. Chasing Venus tells the multifaceted saga of the characters, the adventures, and the discoveries that laid many of the foundations of contemporary astronomy and other sciences. The Boston Globe says of it, the 18th century stargazers, whom Andrea Wolf chronicles in Chasing Venus, proved themselves a different sort from their contemporaries. Their exploits would put Indiana Jones to shame. Better yet, she explains scientific phenomena in clear layperson's terms. Here is a book both astrophysicists and poets can understand. Ms. Wolf is no stranger to the Enlightenment or the history of science. Her previous best-selling books include The Brother Gardeners, A Generation of Gentlemen Naturalists, and The Birth of an Obsession and founding gardeners, the revolutionary generation, nature, and the shaping of the American nation. Those of you with us just about a year ago heard her speak compellingly on founding gardeners, and I'm sure we have similar delights in store tonight. Let's be glad our stars have aligned. Please join me in welcoming Andrea Wolf. star constellation from the night sky. I'm pretty useless when it comes to the stars. I can just about make our Venus because she's the brightest planet in the night sky. So my excuse for this is that I never set out to write a book about astronomy. And chasing Venus is not just about astronomy. It kind of is with the subtitle, The Race to Measure the Heavens. Of course it is. But it's also about much, much more. It's about adventure, it's about passion, it's about the foundation of modern science, it's about the seeds of the global village we live in today, it's about the first global scientific collaboration, and it's about hundreds and hundreds of people who rallied together uh, in the name of science and who transcended national boundaries, politics and religion. So some people have asked me how I came to write this book about astronomy when I was really writing different books before. Uh, it seemed a little bit of a leap from a book like The Brother Gardeners, which is about the British obsession with gardens, or The Founding Gardeners, which is about the American founding fathers and their attitude to nature, gardens, and agriculture. But to me, it was a very logical step. First of all, I've always been interested in the relationship between man and relationship, and I love the 18th century, so that seems all to fit. And also, I came to write this book by accident. That's how I seem to come to write my books. <laughs> I'm waiting for the next accident to happen. <laughs> I have an idea for the next one. So this one, uh, when I wrote The Brother Gardeners, I wrote a chapter about the Endeavour Voyage. And I looked at the Endeavour Voyage through the eyes of the botanist Joseph Banks and Daniel Solon that we were on the Endeavour. 
But of course, I knew that the Endeavour had been sent to Tahiti to observe the transit of Venus. So it kind of popped up there. And then I did the family gardeners. And of course, Benjamin Franklin has his fingers in the pie. So the, it popped up again. And I started to research uh, this story because it just seems really fascinating. Because they were all, you know, there was Catherine the Great involved, and Mason and Dixon, Franklin. And, uh, and I found this extraordinary tale of the first global scientific collaboration. And then the actual book publication also became a global co collaboration. These are all the uh, books which have been published in different countries in the last two weeks. I'm just showing that off. Uh, I'm, missing, I'm, missing the, I'm missing the Japanese cover, I don't know, they didn't send it to me. So, um, so, but let me explain, let's just get the science out of the way. Let me explain what a tran, and I promise you it's going to be really easy because I have to understand it. Um, so, what is a transit of Venus? Transit of Venus is when the planet Venus moves between Earth and Sun. And you can see Venus, which normally is a bright, planet in the night sky, you can see Venus for around six hours crossing the burning disk of the sun. And this is a photograph from the transit of Venus in 2004. So forget solar and lunar eclipses. This year, the heavens have something really exciting in store. Next Tuesday, uh, we will be the last living people to see a transit of Venus. Because the next one is only going to be in 2117, so I don't think we will be alive for that. So as you can see from these dates, uh, a, tr a transit of Venus is one of the rarest astronomical events. They happen in pairs, eight years apart, and then they don't return for more than a century. The first recorded transit of Venus was in 1639, and since then there have only been five transits of Venus. These are the dates. So as you can see, they always come up in pairs. So you have one in 1761, paired up with the one in 1769, then 1874, 1882 is the next pair, and then the next pair, 2004, and then the one next Tuesday. I'm going to talk about the 1761 and 1769 transit. That's what Chasing Venus is about, because in the 18th century, the transit of Venus held the answer to one of the biggest questions in science. She was the key to the size of the solar system. Astronomers believe that if they measured the exact time and duration of the transit, they would have the data they needed to calculate the, si uh, to calculate the distance between Sun and Earth. A latecomer, a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down, be quiet. <laughs> In a corner, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Where you deserve to So they, they believed they could measure the distance between Earth and Sun, and they were interested in four times, um, which were basically the entrance and the exit times of Venus. So they were interested in number one is when Venus touches for the first time the outer edge of the Sun, number two is when Venus detaches herself from the inner edge of the Sun, and then the same on the exit. So these are the four times they need. So they believed that they could use Venus as a excuse me, natural astronomical instrument, almost like a celestial yardstick. The only problem was that they needed as many people at as, many, as at far apart locations on the globe as possible because there was a problem. And this is the only scientific drawing I'm going to show you, but it's much easier than like this. So what happens is this, an observer in the northern hemisphere, we'll see Venus crossing on a slightly different track, crossing the sun, as an observer in the southern hemisphere. And what you see here is the scenario in 1761. So the observer in the north, here, would see Venus entering the disk of the sun slightly later and exiting it slightly earlier than the observer in the southern hemisphere. And with the help of relatively simple trigonometry, which as you can see, you, you know, um, triangles are formed here, they could use the difference between these tracks to calculate the distance between Earth and Sun, but only if they paired up the southern and the northern viewing. So they, they had to, one viewing on its own would not be useful, so they always had to pair them up. Which means the astronomers had to combine their results. And they also knew that there wouldn't be 
a single nation which would be able to finance expeditions to all these different places. So they knew they would have to work together on a global scale. So something really extraordinary happens. In the midst of the Seven Years' War, the astronomers from dozens of different nations which were at war with each other rallied together in the name of science. And they came together in the spirit of the Enlightenment. The race to observe and measure the transit of Venus is really a pivotal moment at that of that age, which is an age where man is trying to make sense of the natural world around him through the application of rational thought. So expeditions were planned to all corners of the globe. So for example, to Tahiti, to the Arctic Circle, India, Siberia, and Baja, California. So this was the most ambitious scientific project ever planned. This is an extraordinary undertaking at a time where, for example, clocks are not accurate enough to determine longitude precisely, which was very important because they needed to know their exact position on Earth to do their triangulation. This is a time where a letter sent from New York to London takes about two to three months. So the sheer logistic and coordination of this global project is unbelievable. The astronomers would have to travel to the remote outposts of the known world. They would have to travel through warring armies, through hurricanes, and they would have to carry instruments weighing half a ton. They would then have to arrive at their distant locations, have to set up their observatories, then they had to determine their exact geographical position, and then they had to set up the instruments. And I'm just going to show you a slide with a couple of them to give you an idea. Uh, so they had to take telescopes and they had to take astronomical clocks. Now the most precise clocks at that time were pendulum clocks. So they are really not traveling lightly, these guys. And they made for rather strange adventures. Because they are not, you know, they're not really used to adventurous, dangerous explorations. They're much more used to the repetitive work <coughs> of nightly sky watching in their observatories in London or Paris or Stockholm. And I found the advertisement for the job description and for the assistant astronomer at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, and I think it summarizes uh, the rather depressingly honest way what they're looking for. They are looking for men who were hardworking and above all obedient grudges. <laughs> so not exactly characteristics we normally associate with globe-trotting um, explorers. And at first sight, the <clears throat> astronomers might have also not look like a typical adventurer. In fact, they were well-fed middle-aged men, and I'm going to give you a little collection of them. <laughs> so you have the French astronomer Jean-Baptiste Chapeau de Roche on the, le on the left here, then Alexandre Guy Pindre, and the British astronomer Neville Maskelyne. But, though they might have not looked like heroes, they did chase Venus across the globe with such bravery and ingenuity. And I would like to tell you some of their stories. In fact, I would like to start with one astronomer whose experiences summarize quite neatly the tragedies and obstacles involved in this project. Let me introduce you to Guillaume Legentil. There's sadly no portrait of him, so we have to kind of imagine him. He was um, the first in the race to um, see Venus, and he sets out in March 1760 from France to travel to Pondicherry on the east coast of India, which was at that time in French hands. And this is a map showing you uh, some of his destinations. So he sets off, and he and the other transit astronomers very quickly um, discover how dangerous it would be to travel in the midst of the Seven Years' War, which had started in 1756 and which pretty much tore apart Europe and the colonial possessions. It's been often called the first global war. And from the onset, Ligentil's voyage was beset with problems. He very quickly gets, uh, his ship gets attacked by the British, his, um, he get, his ship gets into, uh, goes into a hurricane and the sails are shredded to strips. He almost dies of dysentery and it doesn't get better. So at the end of May 1761, this is 14 months after he set out, and two weeks to the transit, 
in June 1761, he finally sees the coast of India. So just when he thinks everything is going to be fine, he receives the devastating news that Pondicherry has been taken by the British and that he can't go ashore. So he sees the transit, the first transit, but he sees it from his boat. Now, on the rolling deck of his boat, his pendulum clock is not working at all. So he sees the transit, but he can't time the transit. So scientifically, his observation is completely useless. He was a quite stoical man, so he thought, like, never mind, there is another transit in eight years. I will just hang around in the area. <laughs> I won't bother going back to Paris. So he goes and stays in Mauritius, which you can see here. And he leaves in 1766, three years in advance um, to the transit, which is in June 1769, and he travels to Manila, because he's calculated that's the best place to observe the transit. He arrives there plenty of time, sets up his observatory, sets up his instruments, he's ready for things. Then he receives a letter from the Academy of Sciences in Paris saying, what are you doing in Manila? We want you to see the transit in Pondicherry. So, <laughs> He packs up his things again, sets sail again, arrives in Pondicherry, which by then, because the, the Seven Years' War has ended, is back in French hands, and he arrives there in March 1760, 1768, so more than a year in advance of the transit. Plenty of time. He's not worried. So he builds an observatory, which you can see here, <coughs> next to the flagpole, and he builds it on the foundations of the ruined fort, because they are strong foundations. Mm -hmm. Could be a good idea, but then at the same time, the, 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 the vault, he built it on top of a vault, which is also the arsenal of a staggering 60,000 pounds of gunpowder, which seems a little strange for a man who, you know, attracts misfortune. And <laughs> but, you know, it was fine. So, he, uh, he waited for, for Venus, and then in early June 1769, after weeks and weeks of clear skies, in the night before the transit, he gets woken by a storm. And he rushes to the window, he opens his window, and he just sees the storm, he sees clouds. And at that moment, Ligentine, who has always remained optimistic, even <laughs> in the most dreadful situation, even he becomes depressed now, and he writes, from that moment on, I felt doomed. And you think, oh, I definitely would have felt doomed a little bit earlier, but never mind. So he lies down on his bed and he can't sleep. And then he um, wakes up, at, he gets up at 6 o'clock in the morning, which is when, the, when he's supposed to see the transit, when the sun rises. But the sun rises behind a thick curtain of clouds, and he can't see anything at all. So he doesn't see the second transit. And then as if the heavens were mocking him, a few hours after the transit, all the clouds disappear and the sun burns into his face. So, he begins his long journey home. And needless to say, everything goes wrong on that journey, but I'm going to spare you those details. But when he arrives back to Paris in 1771, this is 11 years after he's left, he finds that his heirs have declared him dead, and have divided his estate, and that he has lost his job at the Academy of Science. So, pretty tragic. And he was not the only one who was encountering problems. There, um, there were lots and lots of astronomers going on these dangerous long expeditions. And all these expeditions were planned by the scientific societies of Europe. So you had the Academy of Sciences in Stockholm, for example, you had the Academy of Sciences in Paris, and you had the Royal Society in London. And the Royal Society of London, for example, sent out Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon you all know from the Mason and Dixon line. And they were asked to go to Sumatra. And they left in January 1761, a little late because they were delayed by the, by the wind. And um, within days, their ship gets attacked by the French. And it's such a vicious battle that 11 sailors die and almost 50 are seriously wounded. So th these two young men, Charles Mason at that time was the assistant um, astronomer at the Greenwich Observatory. You know what kind of the job description was like. So they had really looked forward to this adventure. And then within days, 
this is all, you know, it has all collapsed, and they never really realized, I think, that they are, you know, that they could die. So they panic, they're traumatized by this battle, and they write letters, lots and lots of letters, to the Royal Society, because their ship is back in the harbor, saying, like, we don't want to go after all, uh, why don't we just go somewhere around the Mediterranean and have, you know, observe it there. But the Royal Society was not having any of that. <laughs> They ordered their disobedient astronomers to continue their journey. Otherwise, they said, they would be punished as mutineers with the utmost severity of law. So, fearing the legal might of the Royal Society, the uh, Mason and Dixon decided to obey, and they went back on their ship, and they set sail. But they didn't quite obey, because in the end, they just stopped at Cape Town and decided to observe there. How was the Royal Society to know 6,000 miles away? <laughs> like all expedition astronomers, they were very worried about the weather because, of course, you needed to have a clear sky to see the transit of Venus. But Mason and Dixon were especially worried because if they would have bad weather and come home from Cape Town with no results, they'd be in big, big trouble. Um, but, in fact, theirs was the only successful transit observ uh, observation of the first transit in the southern hemisphere. So they were lucky and were then sent to survey the Mason and Dixon line in between the two transits and then return to watch the second transit. The Royal Society also dispatched ne uh, Neville Masculine and he traveled with the best instruments and with 100 gallon of wine and rum to <laughs> the remote island of Santelina, which is one of the remotest places still in the world, um, in the an island in the middle of the South um, Atlantic. But it was an important stopover um, Point for the British trade routes. And this is a map which shows you the British expeditions. So you can see Santa Lina, Cape Town, and then Sumatra, where, of course, Mason and Dixon didn't go. <laughs> so for the, but it's planned. For the astronomers, the transits promised scientific revelation. But they also knew that their measurements would improve navigation which was, of course, important for a trading empire or a naval power. So and this, is, this is a fact they used to convince their monarchs and their governments to fund this rather, these rather expensive expeditions. And it's the same argument that the French also used. They sent out, they sent out um, Lichenji to Pondicherry for the first transit, and another one to Rodriguez, which was an island near Mauritius, and another one to Tobolsk in Russia, in Siberia. And it was Sharp Dotarosh who was sent to Siberia. And his 4,000 mile journey from Paris to Russia is also rather grueling. And his journal is full of descriptions of all these accidents that happen. His sledges falling through frozen rivers, his carriages getting stuck in deep snow drifts, which is probably unsurprising if you think that the instruments were weighing half a ton. But he was, he remained cheerful and um, throughout all this and you know, found distraction from his misery by examining the women he met on the way. And he did so with the taxonomic precision of a scientist. So he compared, he examined, and he categorized them. He measured their petticoats in the different villages. He remarked on their sparkling eyes, slenderness of their waist, better complexions, a very disagreeable figure, and well-shaped mates. And this is a uh, engraving from his published journal. This is an interior of a Russian cottage, according to Shah, of course, with a half-naked woman <laughs> sitting there. The last part of the journey to Siberia was then done not in carriages anymore, but in sledges. And this is again from his journal, and you can see here the sledge. There's an enclosed sledge to keep up the cold. And after this very long and slow journey up to then, he gets so excited by the speed they can travel now because they go along the frozen rivers that he um, has a wonderful entry in his diary where he climbs out of the sledge and stands on top of the sledge and kind of stretches out his arms and he just screams and he kind of feels the wind and the speed. And he's so excited, finally he's going to make it. But then the ice begins to melt. <laughs> and it becomes a race against the thaw. And uh, when he had to cross the last river, he had to bribe his men with copious amounts of brandy to um, convince them to kind of push the heavy sledges across the cracking ice where the water was seeping out. And he makes it um, just about 
six days after he crosses the river and arrives, um, the thaw brings the most, the, the ice melts and the thaw brings the most severe spring flood to the area that the region had ever seen. But he was fine, he found himself a very nice place for, of, of his observatory on a little mountain. But then, when he thought that everything was going to be fine, the whole expedition was jeopardized by the locals who wanted to murder him. <laughs> because they thought that this stranger who was pointing his instruments into the sky was a magician who had brought the spring floods over him. So by May 1761, he survived. By May 1761, astronomers across the world are all ready for Venus. And um, the transit astronomers, most of them had arrived at their destinations, but they were not the only ones who were preparing for this event. There were all the astronomers who had remained in Europe. And just to give you a sense of the kind of numbers of the nations. So there were, for example, uh, 30 official observers in Sweden, 40 in Germany, 30 in Britain, 40 in France, and 20 in Italy. Only the Americans were disappointed because in the 13 colonies, you couldn't see anything at all of the first transit in 1761 because the transit here happened in the middle of the night, so you couldn't see it. But there was one man, the Harvard professor John Winthrop, who was determined to at least catch a glimpse of Venus. And he traveled to Newfoundland where he would see the very last hour of the transit. So on 6th of June, 1761, the day of the transit had finally arrived. And as Earth rotated in one location after another, emerged from the shadow of the night into daylight, 250 astronomers at 100 locations across the world pointed at the same time their telescopes to the sky. And I'm not going to tell you who succeeded and who don't. You really have to read the book for that. That would be far too much of a telephone at all. But what I'm going to tell you is that even those who saw a clear sky and who saw Venus on the sun despaired at what they were seeing. And when the results were collected in the scientific societies, which were the clearing houses for the global data, it became very quickly unclear that the observations had not been as successful as they had hoped. The letters were peppered with comments such as doubtful, not sure, not certain, because what had happened was this. Instead of moving swiftly onto the disk of the sun, Venus seemingly was glued to the edge of the sun. So the, for up to a minute, she was kind of stuck before she kind of started her march uh, across the sun. Even astronomers who had stood next to each other couldn't quite decide what was the exact moment of Venus's entry. Now, that was the important data they needed to do their calculations. So the black drop effect, which is what this is called, the black drop effect didn't allow them to determine the time of entry and exit exactly. So that was a pretty much a disaster for them. Um, others had described that the edge of Venus was trembling when she was entering and exiting, and others had, oh, sorry, this is a contemporary engraving of the black drop effect. You can see that in figure five and six, as seen in Sweden. So, and others had also seen this happening, which was like a halo-like ring of light around Venus. All this made it very difficult to take measurements. So, the whole, everything seemed to be you know, not quite straightforward. And the, the astronomers went back and forth, but no matter how much they kind of played with the numbers, and some of them did fiddle a lot with the numbers, uh, they couldn't agree on one value, which would be the distance between Earth and Sun. In fact, their calculations were so wide-ranging that they could only come up with this, which was a 20 million miles difference. So they thought the distance between Earth and Sun somewhere around 77 million miles and 99 million miles. Now, you know, that is a quite big range, but I think it's still pretty impressive because in 1639, Jeremiah Horrocks, who had observed the first transit then, he had roughly calculated that it would probably be just about 55 million miles. Now, today's value is just under 90, we know that it's just under 93 million miles. So, they're not too bad with their 77 to 99 million miles, I think, but for a precise, precise science like astronomy, that was not good enough. But 
they had a second chance. And because there was another transit on the 3rd of June, 1769, and they had eight years to prepare, and they knew this was their last chance because then the next transit would be only in 1874. The conditions for the second transit were much better than for the first transit. First of all, they now knew what to expect in terms of the Black Dog effect. Secondly, the, second year, uh, the Seven Years' War had stopped, so they wouldn't have to travel through war zones anymore. And thirdly, the astronomical conditions were much better because the differences in the duration between the transit as seen in the southern and in the northern hemisphere was greater, which would make the calculations more precise. It was decided that the ideal location for the northern observations would be somewhere within the Arctic Circle, and that the perfect counterpart to that would be the South Pacific. Now, the South Pacific was a pretty empty and uncharted place on the 18th century map, but someone had to go. So it was the Royal Society who decided to arrange this most daring voyage of the time. They formed a transit, transit committee uh, and put Neville Maskelyne, who had seen the first transit in Santelina, in charge of the project. They applied to King George III for money because their own funds uh, had been raided because one of their clerks had embezzled 1,500 pounds. And there's a wonderful letter in which Benjamin Franklin explains what happened. While we have been attentive to what is to pass in the heavens, our clerk has unobserved run away with our money upon earth. <laughs> <laughs> so the king understood the dilemma and granted them 4,000 pounds and a ship was bought and named the Endeavour. And the Endeavour was put under the command of Captain James Cook. And on the 25th of August, 1768, the Endeavour and a crew of 94 men set sail from Britain. And with them, they had a lot of provisions, including 8,000 pounds of sauerkraut against scurvy, and a rather overwhelming collection of astronomical instruments. They even took a portable observatory, which you can see here, you can also see the astronomical clock inside the observatory. And amazingly, Cook manages to find, in the emptiness of the South Pacific, he finds Tahiti in April 1769. And here you can see the Endeavour yeah, anchoring at Tahiti. They had plenty of time to set up um, their instruments and their um, observatory, and the crew enjoyed uh, the island's women, but also had found time to build the fort, which they um, named appropriately Fort Venus, and you can see here the building with the flat pole around one, that's the observatory. But it was not only the British who were preparing, um, uh, who were organizing expeditions, the Russians were also deeply involved. In fact, um, Catherine the Great um, wanted to use the transit of Venus as an opportunity to prove to the international community of scientists and thinkers that Russia was not a backward-thinking country um, with, uh, which was populated with superstitious and alcoholic peasants, which is what most of you thought of the Russian Empire. She was desperate to align Russia with Europe and the Enlightenment, and she wanted to use the transit expeditions for that. So she ordered the um, Imperial Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg to organize eight expeditions, and you can see a map here Really see the, you know, she's really sending them out to the kind of far-flung corners of her empire. These are long, long journeys these astronomers have to do. And this was not just, you know, she didn't just say do that. She, she remained very happily involved. So she, for example, advised on where to send them. She um, wrote letters what kind of observatories she thinks they should buy, what kind of telescopes they should buy, and of course she funded the whole thing. So at this time, Scientists across the world are frantically busy. In Britain, for example, Neville Maskelyne is not only organizing the Endeavour voyage, but he's also organizing one to Hudson Bay, and he's organizing one to the North Cape, um, which is the northern tip of Norway. The Danish king, Christian VII, asked the director of the observatory in Vienna, a Jesuit priest with a rather unlikely name, Maximilian Hell, 
and to travel to Vardo, which was an island in the Barents Sea, also at the very far north of Norway. And um, the Swedes also planned several expeditions to Lapland. And here is a map showing you some of the northern expeditions organized by the Swedes, by the Russians, by the British, and by the Danish um, king. So the, the Swedes, for example, the, the, the observers in the north were having a rather hard time. So the, the, there was one astronomer, a Swedish astronomer, who continually complained about how ugly the lap limit the women wear. And while the Endeavour crew had, had a rather better time, I think, uh, including taking what they called temporary wives, uh, there was one particular astronomer in the north who seemed to suffer a lot, which was um, William Wales, who was sent to Hudson Bay. And he woke every morning during that winter, every morning with his bedding frozen stiff against the headboard of his bed. And he becomes so obsessed with these cold temperatures that he does all these instruments. So he puts out like a pint glass of brandy outside his hut. So like it freezes solid in seven minutes. And then at some stage in January 1769, it freezes solid in three minutes in his observatory. So it's cold. <laughs> and uh, he hated the cold. And then you kind of read the minutes um, of the meetings of the Royal Society. And I found the ones where they interviewed all the astronomers, where they were all allowed to say where they would like to go. And this is what Wales says. He says, he, I was, I, he said he was preferring a voyage to a warm climate. <laughs> so I don't know why they sent him up there, but never mind. And then there was um, Sharp Duta Wash again. This time not battling with freezing temperatures in Siberia. This time he was traveling to Baja, California, on the west coast of the North American continent, which was then in Spanish hands. And again, his journey was riddled with problems. First of all, he got stuck in Cadiz in a, a bureaucratic tug of war for about two months uh, because the king of Spain had given him permission to take one instrument, but that would not really be enough because he needed at least a telescope and a clock. So it took two months for him to get all the right permissions. Then he couldn't find a vessel. When he found a vessel, it was so small that everybody worried they would not survive the winter crossing of the Atlantic. Then he arrived and finally in Veracruz at the Gulf of Mexico to find himself in a hurricane. Then he had to cross the whole of Mexico on mules with all his instruments. Then he had to catch a boat to Baja California. And he arrived there right at the end of May 1769 with four or five days to spare for the transit. So the problem was this, that they couldn't just set up their delicate instruments anywhere. They needed to be protected by an observatory. That's why they had to arrive so much in advance of them. So Chubb had to find an existing structure where he could put up his instruments. And he found that. He found a barn. But the problem was, it was a barn in a typhus-ridden Jesuit mission, which would be um, a, you know, a decision he would pay for with his life. Because he did successfully observe the transit. But he was delirious with fever when he noted the last data. And he died um, there. And this is a drawing of his funeral. His observations were taken back to Paris um, by his assistant. So he, you know, his journey had not, his death had not been in vain. He was not the only observer on the North American continent. There was um, William Wales, obviously, at Hudson Bay. And um, there were altogether 49 um, observers on the North American continent, official observers, because this time the colonists were uh, working very hard to contribute um, their part. Benjamin Franklin masterminded quite a lot of that effort. He was at that time in London, where he was a council member of the Royal Society. So he had been deeply involved in the British expeditions, but he also encouraged the colonists to do their part. Because for him and for his colleagues at the American Philosophical Society, which was really the American equivalent to the Royal Society, it was um, an opportunity. The transit was an opportunity to prove that America was not an uncultivated country with backward thinking farmers, a bit like what Catherine the Great was trying to do. This was in particular important because the French believed that everything in America was, this is what the French say, degenerated, and that America had never produced a man of genius in a single art or a single science. So it was time to prove them wrong. So the American Philosophical Society planned three observations, one in the State House Yard, 
where seven years later the revolutionaries would declare independence. One in Lewis, which was then in Pennsylvania, today is in, in Delaware. And one in Norriton, which was the farm um, of America's first astronomer, David Rittenhouse, just outside Philadelphia. And here's a portrait of Rittenhouse. And he built, especially for the transit, he built an observatory on his farm um, for the second transit. But of course, there were also problems. Um, there were no problems in terms of the astronomers traveling somewhere because they didn't have to travel. But the problem was that instruments had to travel because there weren't enough good telescopes in America to do all these observations. So instruments, telescopes were ordered from London. And the man who oversaw all that was Franklin because he was in London. And um, the problem was that the telescopes he had ordered were delayed because the instrument maker had died. That was one problem. <laughs> And another craftsman had promised to deliver, to deliver, but he was also pretty much overworked because Franklin wrote home that there was such a great and hasty demand on him from France and Russia and our society that possibly he may keep his word, but we are not to wonder if he does not. He did, and the instruments arrived like literally two weeks before the transit. So there were lots of observers in America. There were all in 250 official astronomers across the world are at, uh, at a hundred and thirty locations. Britain was this time leading with 80 observers at 30 viewing stations in Britain and 16 abroad, not counting the North American colonies. Cook and his astronomers succeeded to see the second transit in Tahiti, as did Schaff in Baja California, although he died. In North America, uh, in the North, it was um, Maximilian Hell who delivered the best observation. Catherine the Great stayed up all night and played cards so she wouldn't miss the um, transit with, with sunrise. And King George III watched from a specially commissioned observatory in Kew Gardens. Ligetive, as we've heard earlier, only saw clouds in Pondicherry. And the American astronomer David Rittenhouse was so excited when Venus finally appeared on the sun that he fainted. <laughs> Missing the beginning of the most important scientific event. The there were also lots of um, public views. So wherever astronomers set up their instruments, lots and lots of people assembled to watch the spectacle. And I'm going to show you two contraptions which they use. So, for example, some of them um, build kind of like change their telescopes a little bit so that they could project the image of Venus onto a wall so more people could see it. And then a um, London instrument maker had a very crafty idea because he was charging people to use his telescopes to view the transit. But then he thought, like, you know, if it's cloudy, that would be a bit unfair. So he invented this artificial transit, this is just a painting of it, which was a huge mechanism where a clockwork mechanism moved the sun across the sky and another mechanism moved the beam. Venus across the sun, so that was, you know, in case it was cloudy and could entertain his uh, audience. After the transit, the uh, observers once again shared and exchanged their results, and their letters, almost like invisible threads, kind of covered the world. And astronomers from Madras were sending letters to London. Astronomers from Jakarta sent um, observations to Amsterdam, from Stockholm to St. Petersburg. It's almost like this avalanche of knowledge is rolling over the world at that time. It's really incredible how much they kind of share their results. And this time, with the second transit, the calculations are much more precise. Astronomers were, could still quite agree on one number, but the margins were really narrowing. So this is what they came up with. So there's only a difference of 4 million miles now. And look at the today's value. And look at the, so they're coming pretty, pretty close to um, what we know today. So very impressive, but I think what's e actually much more important than this is that for the first time an international community of sciences, scientists have worked together peacefully and successfully and the achievements of the transit expeditions really changed the world of science. The byproducts, for example, were wide ranging and broad because they had to determine their exact geographical um, positions, their maps improved incredibly after this. Um, lots of astronomers brought back much more than just astronomical data. They brought back 
seeds and pressed plants, such as the endeavor, for example, reports on soil and climate. So this idea of the modern scientific expedition was born at that moment. And from then on, no major exploration ever left without a scientific team attached to it. So for example, if you think of Lewis and Clark, Lewis was educated scientifically in Philadelphia. Charles Darwin on the Beagle, even Napoleon's army, when they went to Egypt, was accompanied by 200 scholars. So for the first time in that transit decade, governments had funded large-scale scientific projects. And never before had scientists banded together on such a global scale. So today, we take this international collaboration for granted, yet we talk about it as if it's something rather recent. And in fact, it all comes from the transit decade in the 1760s. So when we look up to the heavens on 5th of June 2012, which I hope you will all do next week, we really do so by standing on the shoulders of these men who watched the same spectacle almost 250 years ago. So here in New York, you will see the transit in the evening, um, just after 6 o'clock, until the sun sets. So you'll see it for about two and a half hours. And if you want to see it, you have to make sure that you have a free, good view to the western horizon, because that's where the sun sets. Um, so in the States, the further west and northwest you go, the longer you will see the transit. So for example, in LA, the transit starts at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, so it then ends with sunset, so you have five hours. In Anchorage, Alaska, the whole transit is visible with the quiet skies are clear. Um, and, but unlike our brave astronomers who risk their lives for Venus, we don't have to do that. The only thing we have to do is we have to kind of hope for clear skies and you have to protect your eyes. So, you know, you have to get one of these very fetching eclipse glasses if you have sharp eyes. The other option is to, um, if you have binoculars or telescopes, you have to fit them with the appropriate solar filters. That's really important because you're going to, you have to treat this just like a solar eclipse. You're going to hurt your eyes, damage your eyes irreparably if you look straight into the sun. Another option is to take your binoculars, turn them the other way around, and project the image of the sun onto the wall or onto a piece of paper, white piece of paper, and then you can look at the piece of paper directly. And if this is all too complicated for you, uh, NASA is doing a, le a live webcast from Hawaii where you can see the entire transit, and they have very good weather predictions there, so you can watch it on your computer. But I think we should try and see it for you. Thank you. would occur at that eight-year separation? Um, they, they knew that already in the 17th century. They knew, so the, 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 the first, trans, first recorded view of the transit in, in 1639 by Jeremiah Horrocks. So Horrocks had gone, had gone to some astronomical tables, had found a mistake in there, kind of recalculated it, and he knew that it's going to happen on a particular day in December 1639. So they could calculate, they could predict that. They could even predict, they were pretty good at predicting the time also, if it would happen in the morning or in the evening. So they knew that. And actually, this whole project only happened because in 1716, which is you know, almost 50 years before the first transit, Edmund Halley, from the Halley Comet, he writes a 10-page essay in Latin, to make sure that everybody can read it, in which he says, in 1761, and he knew he's not going to be alive then because he would have been 104 in 
761, there will be a transit of Venus, and we have to use that to measure the distance between Earth and Sun. So he's, he's like throwing down his gauntlet. He's like calling for action for a future generation of astronomers. And he's giving them exact instructions what they have to do. He's suggesting locations where they should go. So this was, you know, this was very long in the planning. Yes? My 17-year-old boy is studying uh, for his calculus exam right now. Oh, so I can't get him to focus on this. But I read, I read uh, the part of the book where the calculations are made and you have the footnotes, uh, sort of mm -hmm. in the middle. And I, can you possibly explain how the triangles work? And, and <laughs> if, if you can't... No, I can try. Okay, great. And then also, how, does, how do they extrapolate from that the size of okay. the uh, solar system? I was, I was expecting a question like this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I did not do it without this. Okay, so let me try to explain. I mean, it's, it is really complicated. What they, are, what they are looking for is the difference between these two tracks, yeah? So track seen from the south, track seen from the north, yeah? This, if you, do you know what a solar parallax is? I didn't know that. So a parallax is, um, when an object shifts, apparently shifts from when seen from two different places. So a very easy thing to do is like if you hold up your thumb, look at the distance, close one eye, and then close the other eye. You see that it looks like if your thumb is jumping. Are you all doing it? <laughs> so in the transit of Venus, what happens is that the left eye says the observer in the northern hemisphere. The right eye is the observer in the southern hemisphere. The sun is Venus, and the background is the, the sun. So this is this here. This shift, which you see with your thumb, that's the shift. That are the two tracks. Because they can measure, because that's what they're measuring, they then know this angle through that. That's really complicated. I'm not going to explain that. But through that shift, they, can, they get this angle. Now, if you have an angle of a triangle, and you know the exact geographical positions of the northern and the southern observer. You can calculate their distance between uh, on Earth. You have this bit of the triangle, which means you only now you can now calculate this bit of the triangle. So this is not the whole calculation. <laughs> they knew because of Kepler's third law in the 17th century. They knew the relative distances in the solar system. Because you, you can calculate that through the time it takes a planet to orbit sun. You can calculate its distance. So they knew that, for example, um, so Kepler used the distance between Earth and sun as one astronomical unit. He didn't know how long it is, but that was one astronomical unit. The distance from Jupiter to sun was five astronomical units. The distance of Venus to the sun was 0.28 astronomical units. So this elusive astronomical unit, which was the distance between Earth and Sun, that was what they needed. Now, if they had the distance, this, this, this distance, then they could, through Kepler's law, calculate what the astronomical unit is. Thank you. Also, thank you. Okay. Does that mean that the calculus is not needed for this calculation? As far as I don't know, but I am, re I am not a mathematician, I am not an astronomer. Someone in this room will know more than I about this. But it's, it's, you know, it, is, it was relatively simple. The big, big problem they had, actually, was not so much the calculation. The big problem was to identify this distance, for example, between the observers. Because for that, they had to determine the exact geographical um, position, which was based on longitude. Longitude was at that time still very difficult to determine. That was one problem. Even if they had managed to determine that exact uh, longitude, they had a problem that the French astronomers used Paris as the zero longitude, and the British used Greenwich as the zero longitude. But the exact distance between those two longitudes had still not been determined. So there was a lot of kind of going back and forth and moving this a bit and moving that a bit. Okay, a non-mathematical question. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'll take you away. Um, <laughs> two two uh, quick questions. You mentioned there were three factors that include the love between two different uh, times. 
Were, were there advances in the science that also helped during that period? Not really. No, not really. What they so what they did for the second round is they used many more telescopes with so-called achromatic lenses. They had already existed in 1761, but they were quite expensive. They were pretty new then. So most astronomers didn't think it was necessary to buy new, uh, new telescopes for that. But after the, the problems with the first transit, a lot of them decided it was actually worth getting these better new achrom achromatic lenses, basically when you have two different types of glass uh, put together and that the diffraction is kind of less. So they also decided that it would be good if they would ideally all use the same telescope to kind of standardize um, the measurements. So that they, they did that. That's why the instrument makers all you know totally totally. overwork because they all get like um, orders from the different scientific societies. My second question is completely unrelated. Uh, was masculine the astronomer uh, related to the dynasty of magicians? Of what? There's a dynasty of magicians named Massimo in England, and I think no, one thing he was related to that because it went up to several generations. No, I don't know. I, I mean, I know that he was, the, he was the son of a parson, he was a curate himself, so I don't know. Okay. Yes? Did you say that Cook died of a, of a fever? No. Shaftel no. Torosh died in Baja, California. Cook didn't die. I mean, Cook died. On his third journey, because he was murdered. Murdered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but he this the Endeavour voyage was his first journey. So he comes back, he celebrated as a hero. But his astronomer Charles Green, he dies of a fever, um, which he contracts of malaria actually, which he contracts in Jakarta. So there are quite a few astronomers dying, but Cook didn't. Well, he subsequently dies though when he gets killed. Yes, he dies. He dies on the third voyage. He gets killed. Yeah. Thank you.